due to, due to any clashes and commitments, let us know. The event will be on YouTube, live streamed on F, uh, Facebook, and also the Green Left Facebook site. Um, Rachel, do you want to add anything on that, or is that good enough? Good. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm, um, due to I'm a TAFE worker. I'm a member of the Public know, Service Association and CPSU. And I was born in Sri Lanka. I've done a PhD in Labour Studies from University of Western Australia. I've written a couple books. Um, my first book was about the labour movement in Sri Lanka. I, uh, I'm mostly looking at trade unions uh, in the worker, nurses, I'm among the nurses, the tea plantation workers, and, and free trade zone workers. And, and that was my first book. And the second book was about sports, which was about um, looking through the lens of the global south and the kind of the marketization of sports and also, you know, the ways in which people are resisting within and outside uh, this sports mega events. So that was my second book. Anyway, uh, I'm also a member of the Socialist Alliance. So we are hosting this forum for our workers' rights as COVID health crisis deepens and as many workers are facing multiple challenges, including being sacked. Also, you know, the ways um, I'm one of those, by the way. <laughs> we have seen massive layoffs in airline workers. So health second. workers have been no, anyway, have, have um, to strike for personal nice. protection so equipment. And casual world. workers had to fight as tooth and nail for the pandemic the leave. And as many um, the job cuts that was announced in TAFE, in my personal context, uh, has been happening since last September. And there's ongoing resistance um, that's uh, organized by, by the unions. Um, meanwhile, the New South Wales government is finally, along with the federal government, offering uh, COVID disaster payments, but it's not enough. Uh, a moratorium on evictions has been reestablished, but no stay on mortgage payments. Um, this is unlike the first COVID lockdown. So um, this has meant incredible stress for low paid workers, paying off mortgages and increased collective health risks as poorer workers have to take shifts, work shifts and live in more cramped conditions and living precarious working lives. Um, meanwhile, large corporations are benefiting from the generous corporate welfare bailouts that they're receiving in this process. But people are fighting back. People are organizing and engaging in collective action in different ways. So tonight, we will hear from speakers, workers on the front line of the fight for better workers and wages and conditions. First, we'll hear from Dr. Nico Lika, who has recently uh, uh, been elected to the branch president of the Warta Mental Health Central Center ba uh, branch of the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association. He's a long-term refugee rights activist, a member of the Socialist Alliance, and have been a leading uh, wildcat strikes in Newcastle and uh, multiple other places. The, uh, then we will hear from Zoe Davison, who is a stood down worker at the Annette Kellerman Aquatic Center in Marrickville and a United Workers' Union member. Dr. Nico and uh, Zoe will, will be live recorded. And we will switch this off and hear from Annabel Morales, a New South Wales Public Service Association, Association counselor who represents the PCSA, PSA and the CPSU, just like uh, me, on the, but she represents it in the State Public, uh, Public Services Federation. Uh, the National Federation of the State Public Sector Unions. Finally, this forum is put on by the Green Left and the Social Science. Articles and the podcasts are being uploaded to the Green Left, uh, Green Left Daily online. In COVID times, we are producing a fortnightly hard copy edition. We produce podcasts, small online videos, uh, a newspaper and organized forums, walking tours, 
comedy nights and other cultural events in non-COVID lockdown times. If you like our work and, uh, and you're not, a, uh, not yet a supporter, please consider becoming one. It's $5 a month and $10, uh, $10 per month for a hard copy sent to your home and digital, uh, the digital to your inbox. Socialist Alliance is an activist anti-capitalist party involved in grassroots campaigns and we run elections. Uh, we run in elections, council elections. And um, if you're interested in finding out more about Socialist Alliance, please register in this Google document that's in the chat that Rachel or Jim will, and uh, Rachel or Jim will be in touch with you. Now we will look at uh, a, a, a song, an activist song that Nico has put together uh, to show solidarity with the Sydney lockdown. Um, ben, if you would introduce that, thanks. Hi, Sydney nurses, Nico from Newcastle Waratah Mental Health Branch. We're playing a song in solidarity for you guys, and it's also a song written by Phil Monsour for the Queensland Nurses Union in their battle for ratios. So here we go, it's my friend Sally over. Over there, the dude behind the camera is Michael, and we're Noisy Corner. Nurses and midwives, someone who cares, the first people he meets. In the union we stand, messy challenges won, for rights, respect, dignity. Our union, our voice, we are united, better work, better life. Okay, so that was just a taster of Nico's song. And, um, and we are gonna have, play the full song at the end of this. So um, everybody, you will have to wait around to listen to the full song. All right, so we will begin today's discussion with uh, Nico first, uh, and he will talk for about 10 minutes, and then Zoe will talk for another 10 minutes after Nico. Nico, would you please? Okay, thanks Thanks for that introduction. Um, so uh, the Nurses Association, we've been fighting a battle for um, nurse-to-patient ratios because um, the moment um, you, know, you go to work and you never know if there's going to be enough staff to actually do the job you're supposed to be doing, as well as to satisfy the bureaucracy. I'm going to talk really fast because I've got 10 minutes, yeah? Um, you've also been fighting for a decent wage, just like a lot of other people have been fighting. Um, and um, um, also, um, oh, what's the other thing? Oh, yeah, car parking, because they sting us a lot of money for car parking. The 0.3% um, they offer wouldn't even pay for that. Um, and so, you know, they a little bit of a ruckus and um, they bumped it up very quickly to, um, what was it, 1.7 or something? Um, we walked out. I didn't lead the strike. Um, I was amazed. We um, we just called a meeting and, you know, like normally you call a meeting and, you know, hardly anyone comes. But this time there was a lot of people and um, and they decided they were angry and um, they were the ones that, that um, called the strike, you know. And so we walked out and 24 hours. Um, we weren't prepared for it because we weren't prepared for the bullying tactics of managers and so on. But Next time we will be, and we can't call it a strike, so we'll call it having a birthday party or something. Um, but what's interesting is that um, I think Belmont Branch went out at, on much the same day, um, and the Newcastle Herald was very, very supportive. The, um, the secretary from the Belmont Branch, Caitlin Arvidson, wrote an absolutely brilliant letter to the Herald, which um, presented all the facts, knocked them dead. Um, and then a number of other branches have also walked out since then. But then we got hit by the COVID shit. And, um, and at the moment, Rachel said to me, um, we're talking about this yesterday, what does it look like being overrun? Well, you know, first of all, we don't have ratios. So a lot of the time we're short-staffed and scrambling anyway. Um, 
Overrun means um, people who have been admitted and not been tested, or otherwise they're being tested and we still don't have a result and they turn up on the ward. Um, there's stuff like um, we've got a very small amber area, which is like the area in which anyone who is possibly um, COVID positive is kept, small amber areas. Um, transfers become a problem, you know, like getting people from A to B in lifts and so on. Even if you've got someone who is a risk, uh, can you hear me okay, by the way? Um, if someone's in a risk, you know, a potential risk, then um, where do we put them? Um, air conditioning, for example, you know, we don't have rooms in which you can physically like isolate the air for, from that person so it can be spread through the air conditioning and so forth. A lot of this stuff is, of course, um, the infrastructure was not built with that kind of scenario in mind. Um, general hospitals, to a certain extent, are, are better built because they have negative and positive pressure areas, but mental health doesn't at all. Um, and so um, we're really scrambling to find solutions there. Um, the other thing is we have to do stuff like um, if someone comes in, you don't know what their status is, you have to try and keep them. Sometimes they're kept out in the courtyard. And this is even happening in the general hospitals as well. Um, the other issues, like some places have got this public-private partnership happening, which means, you know, um, there's no, no cooperation really between each side. And so, um, you know, just offloading, insisting that you take someone, um, not my unit necessarily, because um, this information is not drawn from my unit. There's a WhatsApp group uh, and it's got mental health nurses across the state. Um, and so it's happening across the state, um, various units across the state. We've got a lot of instances of managers abusing staff and vice versa because there is an extreme level of anxiety. People are crying and broken up, you know. They, um, a lot, one thing that is consistent uh, is the bus conductor mentality. And a lot of the time, the PPE materials, personal protective equipment, are locked away in the uh, nursing unit manager's office or something like that. <laughs> That happens a bit. Um, so um, there's also, you know, it's bizarre. In some places, um, they were doing screening um, before, you know, when you arrived at work, but a lot of places, they're not doing that anymore. And they just expect staff to, um, you know, screen themselves. It's basically a temperature check, but there's no recording of that. Um, and so, you know, essentially nobody feels safe. That's the thing. Um, and I think that's the feeling of being overwhelmed. Like you're going to work and you do not feel safe. We didn't feel safe before anyway, um, particularly in my area, because you do get assaulted every day. But, you know, it's, it's just sort of par for the course. But this is different. This is like across the state in a variety of units. I'm being attacked by my cat here. Um, <laughs> um, I can hear her in the background. But, yeah, nobody feels safe. Um and the other thing is that there's different rules in all these different places. So, um, you know, some places they, they have better procedures than others. But there is one question, and this is a big question, and that is what do we do if someone comes in and they actually test positive? There's no solution. There's no answer. There just simply is no answer. What do we do if there is a code black? We have to Donald, which is like a violence response to violence donning the um, personal protective equipment going in there, it's very cumbersome. But then, you know, you've got, in the past, you would have allied health helping out, but again, you know, we've got this situation there, reduced manpower, a lot of them are working from home, so they're not available. Um, the response from the ministry has been a matter of denial and blame shifting and outright lies on occasion. The issue of paid pandemic leave is a big one. Um, the casualization of the nurse force, getting back to Socialist Alliance territory, um, that's been happening over the years, means there's um, a shitload of people that are not entitled to paid pandemic leave. What they do offer, if you're in the public health system, is if you have book shifts as a casual, then you might get paid for those book shifts if you have been like a um, close contact or casual contact. But um, if you're in the private sector, you're stuffed. There's nothing. You have to use your own leave if you've got it. Um, in the public sector, if you're, a, you know, um, what do you call it, um, permanent staff, you've got access to 20 days of, of paid leave. Um, so how am I going for time? You're pretty close to it. Um, yes. Three minutes. Yeah. So at the, at the moment, overall, 
One good positive thing is that the government caved in, um, rolled over a little, a little bit. They gave us 2.1%. They just went to the IRC saying, we're giving those nurses 2.1% whether they like it or not. And we said no, because there's nothing about ratios. And that is the sticking point, is getting those ratios. Um, because without it, we're just, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you get. You go to work and you feel apprehensive whether there'll be enough staff there or not. Um, yeah, so um, a poor response, um, something which could have been far better handled at the outset. They had a lot of time to plan for this. It was foreseeable. They haven't learned any lessons from the Victorian experience. New South Wales government have been pussyfooting around and they're going to be losing lives. Um, you know, this still has got its course to run. Um, and because of all that, you know, the casualisation of the workforce, don't get me started on the aged care sector. That is an absolute disaster. You have like three staff to 100 people. How are you going to manage COVID with that? And they're casual staff. So there we go. On that very grim note, three minutes, yeah? Or yes. I'll do it. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, for that. Sorry if you can't see my visual. Um, we are working on it. And Zoe, Zoe is next. She will do a short introduction and let us know what's happening in her workplace. Zoe, please. Hi, thanks, Janaka, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, my name's Zoe, and I'm in the United Workers' Union and I'm one of the workers involved in organising the campaign for paid pandemic leave at the Annette Kellerman Aquatic Centre, a council-owned leisure centre that is privately run by Belgravia Leisure. Our campaign has had numerous successes despite all the challenges that come with organising during a pandemic, such as harsh restrictions, heavy policing and rising health concerns surrounding the new highly transmissible Delta variant. Um, these successes were also in spite of a relatively small union presence at work and our work is being made up of mostly young workers. During this report, I'll take you through all the key events of our campaign um, as a potential framework for organising during lockdowns and discuss the successes and challenges we faced as young workers in a pandemic. Um, so it started on the 26th of June when all staff at Annette Kellerman Aquatic Centre received a short email confirming that the centre would be closing in line with government restrictions and that all staff would be stood down and de-rostered until further notice, leaving permanent staff with the option to take their hard-earned annual leave in lieu of being paid for their regular shifts and casuals with absolutely nothing. Due to the nature of the hours, pay and seasonality of the work, Many of the workers at Annette Kellerman are young students with limited savings, and this put them at risk of severe financial insecurity, as many could not access leave from their employer um, or receive supplementary payments from the government as they were ineligible for the disaster payment. On July 5th, United Worker, Un United Worker Union members had a meeting with management urging them to provide more support for their workers in the form of paid pandemic leave. Management refused, claiming that the business couldn't afford to pay its workers during lockdown, despite Belgravia Leisure being a multi-million dollar company with their CEO featuring on last year's Australian Financial Review Rich List. Uh, they insisted that it's the responsibility of the government to support workers and instead offered their support through a corporate solutions-based counselling service and at-home workouts. While the government failed in introducing adequate and accessible support through this lockdown, we argued that it was unacceptable for Belgravia to profit off the efforts of workers and then discard them when there was a difficult period. Belgravia has billions of dollars in assets and yet still expects workers to bear the cost of the lockdown. In an email sent to staff, Belgravia said that last year's lockdowns were proof that individual employers cannot be held responsible for workers. If last year's lockdowns were proof of anything, they proved that workers everyday Australians are the ones that bore the brunt of financial difficulties while companies benefited from schemes like JobKeeper and billionaires doubled their profits. We have held multiple actions in response to this. The first was a COVID safe in-person demonstration prior to the restrictions tightening that was dispersed by police despite being in a group of less than 10, being socially distanced and or wearing masks. While we can't know for sure, we strongly suspect that the police were called by management, who would have had a good view of the demonstration from their office above. In response to this action, all staff received another email saying that while management supports the right to have our voices heard, our concerns were misplaced. 
It was after this action that restrictions tightened further and we had to think of alternate ways to protest that kept workers and the community safe, both from COVID and the heavy policing that has become increasingly prevalent over this lockdown, especially in areas such as Sydney Southwest. Due to this, the second action held on July 10th was a day of community support that was held entirely online. Members of the community were encouraged to send in pictures holding signs of support and solidarity and to send emails to the City of Sydney Council calling for Belgravia paid pandemic leave and condemning the privatisation of council home facilities. This action was an incredible success and was able to garner significant immediate attention, as well as a flood of support from the community and local councillors. Despite this, management were resistant to meet with us another time and maintained that it was solely the government's responsibility to support workers. The success of that action, along with the growing support throughout the union movement and the growing frustration of the public, allowed us significant opportunities to raise awareness, engagement and focus the discussion around the most vulnerable people that were slipping through the cracks. During this period, we gave multiple print interviews, appeared on radio and television news programs, including Green Left Radio, Channel 7 and ABC News. Myself and another colleague were among several workers to meet virtually with New South Wales Labor leader Chris Minns to discuss our ineligibility for the disaster payment and the need for more support. The most recent action we held was a car convoy organised by Annette Kellerman Workers and the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, which called for the disaster payment to be extended to those on income support and for the implementation of paid pandemic leave and test and isolate payments. We chose a car convoy um, for the relatively COVID safe um, way that we could conduct it. Unfortunately, due to the extension of police powers and the massive anti-lockdown protest occurring the weekend before, the car convoy was subjected to a heavy police presence and nine fines were handed out to uh, participants. Fortunately, though, the Unemployed Workers Union organised a support fund that has raised all of that money to pay for the fines. Our first win that we saw was the increase of the disaster payments and the extension of eligibility to those on income support who, can, who have lost work. While this was a big improvement and a testament to the positive change that can be brought on by collectivism and union pressure, the payments are still riddled with issues and exclude many, including those who cannot prove they've lost work, the unemployed and those on disability support payments or the pension. The payments still differentiate between those on income support payments and those who are not, even if their circumstances are otherwise identical, as those of us on income support are eligible for a flat fee of over $200 top up um, rather than the disaster payment. This is despite the fact that income support payments are not one flat rate, so that leaves those on payments like youth allowance with less. People on income support are also still required to apply fortnightly, even though this is no longer the case for those not on income support. Not to mention the massive delay in the implementation of support for those of us on income support, leaving many with drained savings accounts and climbing debt. I was one of the many people on income support that was left without any supplemented income for a month and a half. Due to the already low rate of the payments, many people on income support live paycheck to paycheck or have very little savings. During this period, I was living, losing over $500 a fortnight in income and not receiving any additional support while having to pay rent, bills, groceries and other expenses, and I was not the only one. For many, this is not possible without family or community assistance or in less fortunate situations accruing debt. With the government failing to back pay these individuals, many will be paying for this lockdown long after it's over. More recently, the government have announced the implementation of one of our other demands, test and isolate payments, though these also leave significant gaps. However, this is a crucial step toward properly supporting workers and stopping the rapid spread of COVID in workplaces. There can be no end to lockdown without properly supporting workers to stay home when it is safest to do so. Unfortunately, the COVID situation in Sydney has gotten worse, with case numbers continuing to increase despite harsher restrictions in being introduced. The lockdown makes it difficult for us to build a union membership at work, which is crucial for us to win more demands in the future. We're looking to the future and working out concrete demands that will improve our workplace and draw more of our colleagues to join the union. The COVID pandemic has been a disaster for the working class and it is crucial that we can work together to find ways to defend workers from the health risks of COVID and improve support measures for the unemployed and precarious workers. Our success, despite the challenges of a pandemic and the fact that we are young workers in a small union, show that any work site has a potential to make change. And the more that we can get to, to work at that, the more likely we are to make significant change. Thanks, Janica. Thank you, Zoe, for that. 
Wow, that was that's a lot going on there, Zoe. Thank you. Um, next speaker um, is um, Annabelle, and um, now we will turn off the live stream. So for people watching. Like <laughs>